In our headlines on this Tuesday afternoon, April 16th, here in South Korea. President Yoon seok vows to keep priority placed on public livelihoods in his first direct address following the ruling party's parliamentary election defeat last week to its liberal counterpart. Meanwhile, in the Middle East, Israel pledges a painful response to Iran's drone and missile assault that took place over the weekend, but adds the response will not trigger a wider regional war. On the trade front, Korea's import price index gained 0.4% on month in March, rising for the third month in a row amid higher global oil prices and greater demand for fruits. President Yoon seok yeol has acknowledged the ruling party's disappointing parliamentary election result, adding that the result itself is tangible indication of the need for greater effort to ensure the livelihoods of people here. For more on his remarks, I have our senior correspondent Oh Soo-young standing by live on the line at the Yongsan presidential office. Soo-young, do start us off then. Hi, Sunny. So President Yoon seok speech today struck a contrite note as he said that he had tried but failed to deliver tangible changes to people's livelihoods over the past two years of his presidency. He said that his administration had focused on making systemic, systemic improvements to the Korean economy through his uh, key industrial policies to nurture new export markets, make businesses more competitive, stabilize the housing market, as well as enable small investors to make more gains from the financial markets. However, in the grand scheme of things, the, pre the president said that the administration had failed to closely examine the difficulties that everyday people face. He pledged to be more flexible and also communicate more, as well as pay more attention to the voices of the people struggling to make ends meet, saying his administration must get closer to the people and listen to their difficulties on the ground. 국민께서 바라시는 변화가 무엇인지 어떤 것이 국민과 나라를 위한 길인지 더 깊이 고민하고 살피겠습니다. To the stand, Yoon plans to continue a series of policy forums around the nation which invite local citizens to discuss issues affecting their livelihoods. He's held a total of 24 of such meetings since January. Yoon also vowed to move ahead with the three major reforms for education, labour and pensions to overcome a more fundamental um, systemic barrier to future growth for the Korean economy, as well as pushing ahead with his medical reform. Now, in light of the public controversy over the rift between the government and junior doctors in carrying out uh, changes to the medical delivery system, President Yoon said that the government will listen to rational opinions. So all in all, the president appears to have been saying that he was too consumed uh, looking at the forest to take actual notice of the trees. Right. Meanwhile, Suyong, what's the latest regarding the reshuffling of his uh, cabinet? Right, Sonny. So that hasn't happened yet, of course, and uh, President Yoon's speech indeed comes ahead of this anticipated overhaul of his most senior officials, um, most of whom resigned last Thursday uh, following the election results. Now, his office has hinted that uh, this overhaul would be the first step of the impending reform. And this is to reflect, uh, leading up to the election, the criticism surrounding Yoon's close aides and his appointments for government positions, including the former ambassador to Australia, Lee jong -sup. The administration has also been criticised for lacking in uh, public communication and flexibility when it comes to pushing through with its major policy initiatives. So Yoon is expected to first replace the chief of staff and prime minister, uh, probably with veteran politicians who can more skillfully handle diverse issues as well as communicate better with various actors, including the opposition-held parliament. After that, Yoon's officers believe to be considering a cabinet reshuffle, as well as possibly changing the structure of the presidential office. Uh, the presidential office itself to become more communicative and receptive to public opinion. Right, I see. All right, Suyong, thank you for that coverage. That was our senior correspondent, Oh Suyong, with the latest from the presidential office. Moving on to the international front, Israel has shared intentions to respond to Iran's air raid this past weekend, with the, which the U.S. claims took place without warning from Tehran. Our Shin Hayang reports. 
Israel's war cabinet met on Monday to discuss how to respond to a direct attack from Iran against the country overnight on Saturday. According to Israeli media outlet Channel 12, Israel is weighing up retaliation options that are intended to be painful to Iran, but without causing an all-out war in a way that coordinates with allies, including the U.S. Following the attack at the weekend, U.S. President Joe Biden warned that Washington would not participate in any counteroffensives launched against Iran and would only continue to assist in defending Israel after it helped to shoot down most of the missiles launched on Saturday alongside other allies. During the meeting, the Israeli cabinet reportedly agreed on a strong response to make it clear that Israel does not tolerate Iran's recent attacks. We are considering our next steps and this launch of so many missiles, cruise missiles and drones into Israeli territory will be met with a response. Meanwhile, Iran said it gave notice to neighboring countries and the U.S. days before it attacked Israel, but the U.S. denied the claim. But there was never any message to us or to anyone else on the time frame, the targets, or the type of response. White House National Security Council spokesman John Carby said that Washington is working with G7 countries on new multilateral sanctions to target Iran's missile programs. He added that G7 countries that had yet to designate the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps as a terrorist organization are now considering doing so. Pentagon Press Secretary Patrick Ryder on Monday reiterated remarks made earlier by U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, emphasizing a desire to avoid escalation in tensions while affirming the commitment to protect its forces in the region and defend Israel. According to a report by CNN, Israel was set to launch a ground offensive in Gaza's southern city of Rafah, but the plans were paused after Iran's weekend attack. Shin Ayong, Arirang News. Meanwhile, the U.S. State Department has reignited concerns over North Korea's bioweapons program. In an annual report issued back on Monday, the department claimed the regime now possesses a, quote, national-level offensive in its bioweapons ambitions. This latest claim compares the wording of last year's report that noted, quote, a limited capability. Military analysts in recent years have raised concerns about North Korea's advances in genetically engineering biological military products by describing the regime's capability as underestimated and highly lethal. And in Washington earlier on Monday, officials from South Korea and the U.S. counterparts addressed the status of North Korea's human rights situation. According to Seoul's foreign ministry on this Tuesday, its official Chan Young-hee sat down with Julie Turner, U.S. special envoy for North Korean human rights issues. The ministry added that Pyongyang's, quote, obsession with nuclear and missile capabilities is violating the basic rights of people in North Korea. The two officials, for their part, have reportedly agreed to advance efforts to raise greater awareness of the regime's appalling actions. Japan has renewed its claim over South Korea's Tokto Islets in its 2024 Diplomatic Blue Book, released on this Tuesday. Tokyo asserted its right over Tokto, saying the islets have been Japanese territory in the past, as well as under present international law. Seoul's foreign ministry has condemned the false assertion, calling on Japan to renounce its repeated claims. The latest Japanese diplomatic report also took issue with South Korea's court ruling for compensation from Japanese companies to South Korean victims of wartime forced labor under Japanese colonial rule. Korea's import price index gained 0.4% on month in March, and pundits believe the upward trend may persist this month. Our correspondent Moon Hedion has more. High international oil prices and domestic fruit prices drove up South Korea's imports in March. Preliminary data released by the Bank of Korea on Tuesday show that the country's import price index rose 0.4% compared to the month before. It's the third month in a row that an on-month increase has been recorded. By category, raw materials, including mining products, saw the biggest hike, with oil import prices jumping by 4% from February. 
Crude oil prices have surged due to heightened tensions in the Middle East, rising to nearly 85 US dollars a barrel in March and surpassing $90 earlier this month. A spokesperson from the central bank added that in light of the upward trend in oil prices, the import index for April could also see a rise. Recent data from the Korea Customs Service also show that fruit imports saw a large jump last month, with the total import value of pineapples and mangoes being the highest ever on record. Pineapple imports came to nearly 8.7 million US dollars, while mango imports came to just over 24.7 million dollars. Orange and banana imports too saw a significant rise with the total value of inbound shipments for each reaching the highest level in nearly five years and three years respectively. This comes as unfavorable weather conditions led to a surge in domestic fruit prices over the past few months, prompting the government to pledge reduced import tariffs on a record number of different types of fruit. Meanwhile, the country's exports saw an on-month climb of 0.4% in March, which is the third straight month that the country's export price index has risen. Chemical goods as well as computing and electronic goods drove up exports, with higher prices for memory chips contributing greatly to this upward tick. The BOK explained that semiconductor prices saw an on-month rise of 1.3% and an on-year rise of 18.9%. Moon Hye-ryeon, Arirang News. Samsung Electronics is set to receive over 6 billion US dollars in subsidies from the Biden administration to advance its chip making ambitions in the US. Now, this pledge comes a week after a similar grant to Taiwan's chip making giant. Our Lee Sing Jae has details. The U.S. government announced on Monday that it has decided to provide up to 6.4 billion U.S. dollars in subsidies under the U.S. Chips Act to Samsung Electronics, which is investing in a high-tech semiconductor production facility in Taylor, Texas. In line with the grant announced by Washington, Samsung Electronics will invest $17 billion to expand the size and investment target of the semiconductor manufacturing plant under construction, with a total of approximately $45 billion in investment by 2030. Under the proposed investment in Taylor, the South Korean tech giants will construct a comprehensive advanced manufacturing cluster, including two leading-edge logic foundry fabrications, a research and development fab, and an advanced packaging facility. The $6.4 billion in subsidies given to Samsung Electronics is the third largest to date. American semiconductor company Intel is set to receive $8.5 billion, followed by Taiwan's TSMC, which will receive $6.6 .6 billion. $39 billion worth of incentives were put aside under the terms of the U.S. Chips Act to encourage chipmakers to build, expand, or improve semiconductor facilities in the U.S., with the Commerce Department looking to invest some $28 billion of the total sum in chipmakers like Samsung Electronics. This comes as the Biden administration has been pushing for initiatives to drive up domestic chip manufacturing amid the U.S.-China rivalry. Investments being made by major chip makers, including Samsung, will put the U.S. on track to deliver on its plan to produce around 20 percent of the world's leading-edge logic chips by 2030. Lee Seung Jae, Arirang News. Also in the U.S., Treasury yields there hit their highest level since last November on the back of inflationary pressure at home and fresh violence in the Middle East. Back on Monday, the yield on the 10-year Treasury note surged 4.61 percent. Pundits point out this latest high represents a tangible rise of some 40 basis points since the start of April as various factors cast a dark cloud over potential interest rate cuts by the Federal Reserve amid persistent geopolitical uncertainties. Back on the local front, the UN administration remains committed to its plans to expand medical school admissions quarter by 2,000 seats starting next year, despite the prolonged opposition from medical practitioners. Our Song Yu Jin has the latest. It seems there's still a big hurdle to overcome in the standoff between the Korean government and trainee doctors regarding the expansion of the medical school admission quota. During Monday's Central Disaster and Safety Countermeasures Headquarters meeting, Health Minister Cho Kyu Hong said the government's will for medical reform remains unchanged. This includes a planned increase in the medical school admission quota by 2,000 from next year to tackle the country's shortage of doctors in essential medical fields and rural regions. 
We'd urge the medical community to stop their collective action and promptly engage in dialogue. We have a tight timeline considering the college admission schedule for 2025. The college admission guidelines for the 2025 academic year will be finalized next month, including the medical school quota. Making changes to the quota after that will be impossible. While standing firm on the expansion, the minister mentioned the government's openness to discussing rational and unified alternatives, echoing its previous stance, which hinted at the possibility of adjusting the scale of expansion. However, trainee doctors remain strongly opposed to the expansion. 1,360 trainee doctors who have submitted their resignation letters announced on Monday that they would file a complaint against Minister Cho and Second Vice Health Minister Pang min with the Corruption Investigation Office for high-ranking officials for alleged abuse of power and obstruction of the exercise of rights. They're saying the government misused its power to block hospitals from processing their resignation letters and force them to work against their will by issuing return-to-work orders. One of the seven requests trainee doctors made to the government to return to work in February was the complete removal of the expansion plan. Song Yujin, Arirang News. In other news, a Korean research team has developed a patch that serves to repair severed nerves in a relatively simple manner. Our Chong Eunju explains. When a nerve in the body is severed in an accident, the two ends must be stitched together with a needle. Using thin threads with a diameter of one micrometer, even skilled microsurgery specialists take 15 to 20 minutes to stitch a single strand, making it a precise and challenging process. Although adhesives are being developed to connect severed nerves, there's still no method to mend them perfectly without suturing. Suturing with thread depends heavily on the skill of the surgeon, and foreign substances persisting around or inside the nerve can affect nerve regeneration. South Korean researchers have developed a patch that, when wrapped around like a bandage, securely connects the detached parts. The patch combines a soft polymer and a hydrogel with excellent adhesive properties to connect severed nerves smoothly. The research team used a hydrogel made of natural ingredients on the innermost layer of the triple-layered polymer, which upon contact with the nerve reacts with moisture to produce a strong adhesive force. An elastic polymer was used on the outer layer to replicate the physical properties of real nerves. The patch breaks down into small pieces after the nerves recover and does not affect the body because it is made of biocompatible material. When applied to severed nerves in mice, the area that used to take about 10 minutes to suture with a needle was found to be firmly connected in just one minute. Regardless of who performs the procedure, surgery can be performed easily, simply and uniformly. We expect a good prognosis as surgery time reduction is significant. The research team plans to conduct further studies to apply this patch not only to nerves but also to blood vessels and tendons. Tong Eun-ju, Arirang News. Up next, we tell you about a robot that can detect, deduce and dispatch itself to effectively deal with dangers underground. Here's our Ian Jin. This is the GTXA, the Seoul Metropolitan Express Railway, which became fully operational on March 30th. It travels 50 meters underground at roughly 180 kilometers per hour, which means people will be able to travel from Dongtan to Suseol in 20 minutes. Demand for such high-speed railways is increasing as they shorten commute times and help travelers avoid traffic congestion. But this also means that disaster preparedness becomes of utmost importance. Unlike tunnels on the roads, these railway tunnels do not have CCTV cameras which makes it difficult for control rooms to check for accidents underground. But a team of domestic researchers have developed a smart robot that can not only move along the ceiling of the tunnel, but it can also quickly detect various disaster situations and even help passengers evacuate. The robot's artificial intelligence function allows it to quickly analyze videos taken by the cameras to notify the control room of any accidents. Then the robot arrives at the site within five minutes to help the passengers to a safer location. 
If the robots travel at 20 kilometers per hour and are installed three kilometers apart, they can arrive at any site within five minutes. That way, it can patrol the overall situation on the tracks and detect any abnormal signs. The robot is detachable, making it very easy to install, and all its parts are heat resistant up to 250 degrees Celsius, making it possible to function even in case of fire. The research team will continue to upgrade the robot's AI analysis technology and further test its actual application in railway tunnels. Lee Eun Jin, Arirang News. Let's take a look at the latest news in the world now. Former U.S. President Donald Trump, who is once again running for the White House, began his unprecedented criminal trial on Monday in New York. On the first day of the trial, the court found difficulty in selecting jurors, as over half of the potential jurors were ruled out over concerns they couldn't be impartial. 60 out of 96 potential jurors quickly announced that they could not be impartial. Those who were left were then asked to answer 42 questions in the jury questionnaire, including what news media they read and whether they were supporters of Trump. Trump has been charged with falsifying business records to cover up a $130,000 US dollar payment made out to a former porn star Stormy Daniels just ahead of the 2016 election to buy her silence over an alleged sexual encounter in 2006. While Trump kept quiet during the entirety of the morning court proceedings, with yes being the only word he spoke, the former president spoke to reporters before entering court, saying the trial was nonsense and an assault on America. In Sydney, Australia, a 15-year-old boy has been arrested after at least four people, including a bishop, were stabbed at a church on Monday. Local police reported that none of those stabbed had life-threatening injuries. The stabbing happened during a Monday evening service at the Christ the Good Shepherd Church in Wakeley, a suburb of Sydney. Police were seen trying to control large crowds gathered at the church who demanded for the attacker to be brought outside. The church service was being live-streamed online and was still being broadcast while the bishop was stabbed giving a sermon. Monday's knife attack comes only three days after a mass stabbing in a Sydney mall killed six people. Extreme rainfall, flash floods and thunderstorms have left more than 60 people dead over the past four days in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Heavy flooding due to seasonal monsoon rains killed at least 33 and injured 27 others by Sunday in Afghanistan, while thunderstorms and heavy rain killed at least 36 people in Pakistan. A Taliban spokesperson for the State Ministry for Natural Disaster Management confirmed that almost 20 out of Afghanistan's 34 provinces were affected by extreme monsoon rains, with 600 houses heavily damaged and 200 livestock killed. In neighboring Pakistan, the country's southwest declared a state of emergency on Monday. Authorities in the country said most of the 36 deaths were farmers who were killed by lightning strikes and collapsed houses. Global automotive and energy company Tesla is planning to lay off more than 10% of its global workforce in order to cut costs. After reporting poor first quarter sales, Tesla CEO Elon Musk circulated an email to Tesla staff on Sunday saying that while there was nothing he hated doing more, job cuts must happen. According to Tesla's latest annual report, the world's biggest automaker by market value had just over 140,000 employees globally last December, meaning layoffs could affect some 14,000 staff members. Kim Xiong, Arirang News. Good afternoon. We had a cloudy and wet start to the day. Some of the central regions could see lingering showers through the afternoon. There could be less than five millimeters of rain with strong winds, but rain could be mixed with yellow dust. So make sure to have an umbrella with you, even though rain is spotty.
Northwesterly winds brought yellow dust into the country, boosting dust levels to bad in most parts of the country. And the level could even reach very bad during the day today. It will become much sunnier as the day goes on, but remember, a face mask is a must. After the highs should go up 1 to 5 degrees higher than yesterday, Seoul topping out at 19 degrees, Gwangju at 22 degrees Celsius this afternoon. Just when fine spring weather tries to make its comeback, yellow dust will make us choke in a dust cloud. Meanwhile, sunny skies stay with us as the warming trend continues through the end of the week. With that in mind, here's a look at the international weather conditions. Right, and that ends our afternoon newscast for this Tuesday. Thank you for watching.
Lotte takes a new leap beyond its boundaries. Our change will lead to better lives for all. New Lotte, the power of a better world. New today, better tomorrow. Lotte. Interest in Korea's cultural contents has been on the rise in Europe in recent times, and a Polish couple is doing their part to further promote related bilateral exchanges. Welcome to yet another edition of Issues and Insiders. I'm Min Sun Hee. Today I speak with two guests from Poland who are here in South Korea to support broader cultural interactions between the two countries. I have Patricia Skowska here in the studio. Patricia, it's a pleasure to have you here. Hello, hello. Nice I to also meet. have yeah. <laughs> I also have Marcin Ricek with us. Marcin, it's a pleasure as well. It's a pleasure for me too. <laughs> right then, Patricia, we'll start with you. Let's begin with uh, your thoughts about Korea mm -hmm. and uh, its appeal to you as a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, from my perspective, Korea is very like interesting. First of all, it's like culture, which is totally different than European one, which you know. And also because uh, the history, I think, like we've been like South Korea already suffered from many invasions and occupations. And that is something like is really quite similar to the Polish culture and our experiences. So I was really interested in like from the psychological perspective, what's, uh, how, how the, the society in South Korea grew up, what kind of maybe trauma do they carry? And also like from the perspective uh, where the South Korea very rapidly grew up, uh, they, like developed um, uh, digitality. Uh, and everything is like very, very envisioned here. Uh, so I was like really curious how the societies in here grew up from the, their mental perspective, like what made them up and uh, yeah. And what have you learned thus far? What do you believe has been the impact of our history on our people? Yeah, I think it's like uh, people are really tend to like pursue their goals more. So are, they are determined because they, they had lack of luckiness in their lives yeah they had to survive they had to fight for their their rights for yeah for for many things and i think like it's it's really important to to notice that fact that korea culture is not about everything which is very beautiful right now but also they had like very sad history which made it up Right, as you said earlier, Korea and Poland share a history of uh, being uh, near very aggressive neighbors than in the past. Yeah. Marcin, I believe you are also here in Korea and you have a photo exhibition that's currently taking place and that will uh, last until late next month, I believe. How do you feel? I'm really glad that I have an exhibition here in Seoul. This uh, exhibition uh, was created uh, in cooperation to big institutions like uh, Korea Foundation and Polish Embassy in Seoul. Uh, I, I really like to share with the people my passion to fo for photography. So it's amazing to be here and people who come more for my exhibition very deeply uh, look at my photos sometimes spent spent like a one hour one and a half hour to to the, uh, to watch the, the to look at my pictures um, and you know my photos is like a metaphor uh, you can find own interpretation of these photos and it's really amazing when i can hear uh, when people talk about own interpretation of my photos i can learn about photos, my photos, and then something more about humans. So then uh, I wait many hours for, for this special moments for me. So sometimes five hours in the different country, in the different places and around the world, in Korea too. So uh, I'm really happy that people want to come here to the to, to exhibition. I'm really happy that like a magazine like Ellie and then like um, Jung Ang uh, uh, newspaper wants to publish information by my exhibition that one of the most interesting exhibition in Seoul now. So 
I would like to invite for my exhibition in KF, KF Gallery in Seoul. Right, that will take place until the 24th <laughs> of May then. Yeah, yeah. Patricia, South Korea and Poland, we celebrate 34 years of diplomatic relations this particular year. Now, I understand the Korean cultural contents are also gaining quite a bit of attention over in Poland. What more can you tell us? Yeah, that's true. Actually, like in recent years, it was like it became a neologism, uh, which is called Hallyu Wave. It's made out from the words like uh, means the Korea and the wave. And it's very interesting because uh, I, I spotted like it got a lot, a lot of popularity, but not also in Poland, but also like worldwide. And for example, like in Poland, I think it started many years ago, but also I feel like the big impact on that had the Parasite movie, which like, you know, that got these four Oscars winners. And afterwards it was like a Squid Game TV series. So also it was very popular in Poland. And of course, like BTS group, it was like the, the best uh, <laughs> for, for people who are interested in, in Korean uh, culture. Uh, and I think like it's getting bigger and bigger within the years. So for example, like recent year, last year in Poland, it was organized some kind of uh, festival, K-pop festival for the first time, first edition, you know. So it's getting really, really popular and people are learning Korean language in Poland. There are special communities and already in Poland is like 100,000 people who are a community, like a big fan of, of Korea. So, so that's really impressive and I think like it has a huge potential and I think it's going to grow and grow more and more and within the years. Right, good to know. Yeah. Marcin, I should have asked you this earlier, what are your impressions of Korea? Uh, and this isn't your first visit here, you no, were saying? No, 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 no. Uh, we, we have been uh, four times in Korea because first time um, Pohang International Photo Festival invited me for, uh, to, 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 to this festival to take a pictures to and, uh, and to be to, to, uh, to be, uh, to be like, part of this festival. And I had like a small exhibition there too. Uh, and I met many interesting people there, like, uh, you know, photographers, professors, and they show us uh, beautiful places in Korea. We, were in the, we spent a lot of time in Busan, uh, we were in Seoul and the small, par small places like an old uh, uh, capital of the, um, uh, Korea. So it's something amazing. And, but for me, it's very interesting, like a photographer, it's uh, this relation be between uh, in relation um, tradition and modernity. Here, like uh, for example, you have a beautiful temples, this temple somewhere in the mountains, uh, beautiful wooden palaces and hanoks and, but here, for example, you see all very big uh, modern buildings and sometimes when I see here in Seoul, when the young people with the hanbok, uh, visit very traditional places, but w with new model of the iPhone and take a picture for the Instagram. And it's really, really interesting. And the atmosphere, for example, is Seoul. It's a many galleries, many museums, uh, many places to go with friends. But uh, life go very fast. For example, Busan, where is a uh, beautiful beaches, you can more relax. It's a different, and in the different places you can see very traditional buildings. So. All Korea is beautiful, but all places are different, so it's very, very, very interesting. Well, thank you for your kind words. <laughs> and now, Patricia, let's uh, talk a bit now about the purpose of your latest, latest visit here in South Korea. I believe you are here to make a documentary about a group of granny rappers. Yeah. Tell us a bit about that. <laughs> That's true. So, firstly, when I started to make in, uh, documentary movies, uh, I, when I remember, I was looking for the subject and it was like I was really inspired by one of TV series held by Netflix. It was about longevity. And then I was starting to wonder like what I would like to convey to the world, like to give some message to people. And I found out that in one aspect they were talking about, it was like a whole series about longevity and the blue spheres. So people who are living uh, in a blue spheres close to the Earth equator. And in one aspect they were talking about 
uh, kind of activities, like they are socialized with each other. And then I thought like, okay, that's gonna be my topic. I want to discover more the loneliness topic, how people can connect with each other and how it makes them being more happy, they they can like say like aging is no more existing, right? Like in this case with this grannies, it was like I, I was in shock when I saw it for the first time. I said, no, I have to come here and I have to make documentary. I need to show people that if you gonna find out some, it's called in Japanese language ikigai, so your purpose of life. You, you're gonna be more happy and if you socialize with people and you make communities and you are like living creature, not only being somewhere hidden in a home, like also from Japanese perspective, it's like, it's very also popular uh, there, it's called hikikomori. So people who hide in their homes and they try to avoid each other. But this kind of grannies, this, this group, is, it was special. I, I was really like shocked when I saw them, how you can make a life like more brightful, more happy, and it's, it's unique and it's like worldwide unique. I think like everyone needs to know that, that here in South Korea exists this kind of band. Patricia, I understand the average age of this group of granny rappers is 85 years old. When you met them, when you met them, did you ask them how they started this particular group? Of course, yeah, like for my documentary movies, for that purpose, I had to ask them. Um, it, it was like uh, they were growing on the farms, so they had like really uh, regular life. Uh, they were like outside of all of this digitalized world, which is here very known for Korea, right? And uh, they decided in their elderly age that they would like to learn Hangul. And that was the first point of, uh, of the starting this group. Of course, the huge applause to the coordinator of this um, community who, who started to make them, them superstars and making that band. But also uh, there was a leader. This group is called Suni and Seven Princess. And the leader is Suni. And that girl, <laughs> I would say girl because they are very young, uh, got interested in rap. So she started to look into the YouTube how people are rapping. And after learning that Hangul, they started to make poetries. And that poetry, they turned into the songs and the lyrics of this song. So the whole history behind it is, is really inspirational. What do they rap about? They rap about their daily life, actually. They, how they grew rural up life. on the rural life, yeah. How they grew up on the farms, uh, how, how they feel, uh, how, how they go through the life. And I think it's like really inspirational for, for everyone. I see. Now, Marcin, I understand you were also with Patricia when she went to meet Suni and the Seven Princesses. And based on what you observed there, what would you say are some of the perhaps similarities and differences between the elderly here in Korea and perhaps over in Poland? In Krakow, where we live, uh, in Poland, uh, I had many um, workshops with the older people, like the 80s, like the 70s and it's something amazing these people have a lot of power and they want to learn even they have 80 years old ladies or men want to march in please show me more and sometimes they have even i'm tired they want more and more marching and uh, you know of course body changed but soul some some people have a very young soul when I met these people in Poland, they, sometimes they were younger in, inside than my friends, like a 30 or 20 years old friends. So it's something amazing. And when Patricia um, told me about this uh, grandma rappers, so I thought, oh, it's something beautiful. And we, we are lucky because we can spend time with these beautiful ladies. And we come back once we will come back once again. Uh, so it's these people inspired the young people uh, and old people to, if you have a passion, uh, for sure, and you and you can find good people, so you can be happy to last days on your life. I think. So uh, in Poland we have like a. Uh, we have like, quite nice, interesting people too, like an 86 years old lady. She is like a DJ.
and she make a party for the young and old people. Um, we have, for example, in the place where I was born in Lublin, uh, we have a group of a cheerleader group and they dance like a 70, 80 years old ladies who dance. So it's people are amazing. It doesn't matter how many years you have, how old are you. So, but if you have a young soul, you always be young. Right, like they say, age is but a number. Yeah. So, <laughs> Patricia, earlier on you spoke about how Korea, South Korea and Poland share a number of similarities. We both mm. suffered at the hands of uh, relatively aggressive neighbors and we are also relatively uh, latecomers to uh, democracy. Are any of these uh, similarities perhaps explored in your documentary? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I can observe many similarities between these two nations because, as you mentioned, it's like we are having this post-war trauma and that's for sure that we are having this kind of uh, inside uh, inner backfill that uh, drive us to, to pursue our goals, to go ahead, to, to be mobilized, determined. Uh, and that's for sure. Uh, I, I observe here, like uh, also in Poland, uh, my previous documentary movie was about one guy who's like 75 year old, but he committed his life to, to his passion, to his art, and he was conducting private museum of Nobel Prize re winner uh, Raymond. He rewrote all of the books of Raymond. He painted beautiful illustration inside the books. Unfortunately, like in, in recent times, he unfortunately died. But he was an example of people also like here. If you have a passion, uh, you, you can just do whatever you want. And your life doesn't have to be like black and white. There are like various scenarios from which you can choose. Yeah. And that's, that's really amazing in here. And I'm, I'm so inspired. But back to your questions, uh, I, I don't look to find these similarities in my documentary. I just want to more focus on South Korea as its unique country and show this uniqueness in this specific document and about the Poland I showed already about this writer. Patricia, you speak about how the people here in South Korea, given their past, we seem to be more determined and driven to achieve our goals. Do you see a similar pattern of that behavior perhaps in Polish people like yourself? Yeah, I think like I'm also this uh, kind of person who maybe experienced bad uh, things in past, but that drove me to, to fight for better life and to be more determined, as you said. So I think it's, it's really crucial. And I really believe that this kind of people and this kind of history in people and nations are for some reason. That we are here just to inspire people that they don't have to follow some schemes. They, they can choose their they happy life and it, it doesn't have to be some system way. Like our granny rappers, Sunni and the Seven Princesses. Yeah, that's a then, perfect right? example. Martin, what kind of cultural exchanges between Poland and South Korea do you envision for the future? Uh, I think in the last two years in Poland, interest in uh, Korea culture increased uh, a lot. Uh, in Krakow, where I live in Warsaw, uh, people open uh, new restaurants, people talk about uh, the film and music, Korean music. And the same here, I, when I meet many people, some people know, for, uh, like for example, classic, classical music, Polish classical music, like a Chopin. Uh, and some people know the Polish di film, film director, like for example, Kieślowski, uh, Pawlikowski. Uh, and I think Mm, I would. I think uh, now we are very good relations. I, for example, in my exhibition, many people who come to my exhibition know the photo "A Man Feeding Swans in the Snow." It's uh, one of the the last ten years. is one of the biggest viral in the internet about photos, and people come, the students, and they know because you know now world is a global village but our country now we have very good relation and people re learn more about Poland Korean about Poland Polish about uh, Korea and for example I'm, we met many people who speak learn Polish language in my exhibition many people come with uh, who know the Polish language uh, Korean and in the subway too for example so uh, it's 
amazing and I, I would like to create something more about photography I would like to in the future uh, show uh, will, uh, I would like to show my, uh, some photo, photo, uh, photographers um, in Poland uh, Korean photographers and I would like to show Polish photographers in Korea something bigger and in Pol uh, and, and uh, with Patricia uh, now is a first project here um, but we would like to make more and for example take pictures patricia video and with this rapper grandmothers we, we i hope we make like a bigger project like a exhibition video patricia and we can for example make a tour around the korea and after i hope in poland to show the beautiful people from korea in poland so i think it is uh, something special for us right for sure and i'll keep my fingers crossed <laughs> for that best of thank luck you. in that endeavor then thank patricia also thank you very much for your time and your thoughts today thank you very much right well that is all the time we have for this edition of issues and insiders thank you for watching